Today, I am joined by an absolutely remarkable woman. She is a property investor. In fact, she is SA Property Investor of the Year. She's the founder and CEO of the largest property stock fell, Saki Sizwe Property Stock Fell. She's a mover and she is a shaker. I am really excited to introduce you to Silindile Liseyane. You are going to meet the businesswoman and you are going to hear about her journey. This is somebody that you absolutely should know about. So without much further ado, my name is Hetty the Entrepreneur and welcome to Conversations with Hetty. Let's get into it. Slindile, I am so excited and pleased to be having this conversation with you. In fact, uh, I knew that you were one of the first people that I wanted to feature on this YouTube channel. And the reason for that is that I feel that there are role models all around us. And often at times we feel like we need to go far away abroad to look for these people when there are people that exist among us in our backyard that look like us, that sound like us, and that are doing incredible things. Now, you are a businesswoman, you're a property investor, you are a mover and shaker in corporate. In fact, you were named SA Property Investor of the Year. You are the founder of the largest property stock fell, Sakisizwe Property Stock Fell. So all of these things are such remarkable feats. But before we even get into that, before we look at the top shelf I really want to start from the very very beginning you are a woman that was born and bred in a small town of Petritif and few people would expect such magnific magnificence to come out of such a place right and I really want to talk about that what was it like growing up in Petritif um Thanks once again, Hetty, for inviting me as your guest. I'm honored to be the first one, really excited about that. So I grew up in between Petrodif and KZN because my mom is from uh, KZN in Bangeni and my dad is from Petrodif. So I sort of grew up between both sides of the family in that regard. And primarily like in rural areas, you know, where we still went and fetched water in the rivers and those kinds of things. So my, my, and my primary education was in a very basic um, rural school where we still had pit toilets and all of that. So I really come from really that kind of background where we we lived in those rural areas and then eventually when democracy happened we then you know leveled up as a family and eventually moved to the burbs and all of that so living in a small town i always wanted you know something bigger than that i always knew that this town was not big enough you know to um, uh, to, to accommodate the dreams of this girl i always knew that i wanted something bigger i remember when i in terms of when i was deciding what i wanted to study at university i read an article um at the time i think i must have been in grade eight or nine that said there are only four black cas in the country mm -hmm. and i told myself okay i'm gonna be the i'm gonna be a black ca that for me was a challenge i was like i want to be a black chartered accountant why are they so few black female CAs? I'm going to be one of those. And obviously, in order to achieve dreams like that, they're not going to happen in a small town like Petrativ. So I always knew that I wanted something bigger than that. And I always knew that I had to get out of Petrativ. And um, funny enough, the first time I actually got out of, you know, the small town was um, probably in 1998 when I attended my mother's graduation in UNISA. It was the first time I'd ever seen, like, a high-rise building. Wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> the highest I'd ever seen was, like, two levels like ground yeah. floor and one floor and never anything above that so when i came to study at vits in 2002 it was the first time in my life that i'd ever been in a lift like i went into wow. the lift and i didn't even know like what do i do mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was a real like um a rural girl coming yeah. to the city for the first time and it was a major culture shock in terms of just that adjustment but yeah just to answer your question i came from a small town but i always knew that i wanted bigger and i always knew that i had in order to achieve my goals i had to get out of petrative and so even when i was i was reading books and i was you know and i was watching documentaries and all those things i was always inspired by powerful business women and so i got attracted to the accountancy field because you know i realized that it offered so many opportunities and when I was looking at like the boards of companies, you know, the people that were in the boards were CAs. So that's where I knew that in order to really make it in life, that is the route, the route that I had to take. 
Wow, that's so incredible. And, you know, often at times when you are in an environment where you are aspiring for something that's beyond what you can see currently, you really need to have such a vision for the future. What exactly do you think inspired that within you? Is it conversations within the home? Is it the books that you read? What was that thing that told you that what I am seeking is outside of this particular town? I think just having a mother who was, um, you know, a, a believer in me and she was also, um, um, I can say a groundbreaker in her own right. I mean, my mother was a, a, a school principal, mm -hmm. a female in the 80s which was unheard of, you know, she was one of those people that was already being a groundbreaker in her own right and she was a leader and all of those things. So I was inspired by a mother who was constantly breaking ground and, all, and constantly pushing herself. Like I'm saying, she was graduating, she was still, she even did her honors when she was in her 50s, you know, so she always was pushing herself. And so I cannot have a mother like that and then mean I'm just slacking, you know. Mm -hmm. So I always knew that, um, you know, I had her support and I knew that I, knew I had to make my mom proud. So just having that and, and her open up opportunities for us. I mean, she used to even help me read her UNISA assignments and say, look at what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> you know, so there was always just those kinds of things that I got exposed to from, from a young age. So I think it comes from a family that was very supportive. Whatever you want to do, you know, we're 100% behind you. And I think that is where it came from. That's so fascinating. So when you came now to the big city, you're, you're entering a lift for the first time. Uh, you're now seeing the possibility of this world that you've dreamed for yourself. How does a young, slindile, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed adjust to big city life? I think one of the smart things that I did was that I convinced my other friend who also wanted to do accountancy that we had to come to VITS. She wanted to go to uh, mm. University of Pretoria. I'm like, mm-mm, friend, let us all go to, <laughs> let's go to VITS. <laughs> so, Pfizer, so really, you know, yeah. we'll figure this out together. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think that helped. And so, you know, when you come to Joburg, especially when you come from a small town like that, you can get overwhelmed by city life and you, yeah. and you tend to lose focus in terms of why you are here. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, just... Um, um, having the same sort of friends and being grounded and having a mother that I knew good if I get into trouble yeah, it's not gonna be pretty mm. so just having that that fear and, and 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 also just that continuous search for opportunities mm. um, I think from my first year onwards there was never a holiday where I did not work anyway so I worked in all the accounting firms. I worked in some of the insurance firms. By the time I finished my university degree, I had a CV that was as long as my mm. arm because I was constantly seeking opportunities. I was constantly breaking down doors saying, how can I get access to opportunities? Because I want to know what is life beyond mm. um, you know, the, 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 the university life. So that for me pushed me because I got inspired. I got motivated. I saw what the working life was like and I wanted that for myself. I didn't want to be a failure and drop out and not be able to realize those dreams wow that's absolutely incredible and also having that taste of both studying and the working environment as well what were some of the observations that you saw within the work field that triggered that thing in you that you know what this this what i'm seeing here is what i want i think when you when you when you think about where you come from mm -hmm and you, you, you see a future for yourself mm. and you realize that it's within your hands. If others can do it, why can't I? Mm. You know, so it was just that, that constant realization and that desire to want more. And, and an element of being an overachiever, I was not okay with just being okay. I was always mm. wanting to be getting the good marks and always putting myself out there. So I was never okay with just, some people are like, I just want to pass. For me, that was never good enough. I always wanted to go above and beyond the minimum that was required. So I think that was one of the reasons that I always wanted more for myself. I always pushed myself. Wow, that's incredible. And so then you enter into the working world. Yeah. What was that transition like for you? <sighs> it was rough. I don't want to lie. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a big adjustment um, because I ended up not pursuing the accounting route. 
and so the job that I got into it was a big realization from coming from you know the the protected environment of being a student to now mm. being thrown in the deep end mm. of corporate mm. um, so we all have I know I can imagine all of our backless guys in terms of what corporate um, can do for us um, and, and just that readiness for that for that transition because in as much as I done work work but there was that excitement we've got an intern we've got somebody yes. from grad so let's impress her type of thing <laughs> you know so when you are thrown in the deep end and mm. now you are expected to deliver you know so the, the requirements are a bit different so it was it was a bit different for, it, it was a bit difficult for me um to adjust and i don't think i was um adequately prepared mm. for that huge jump so my first year or two of working was really really hard um you know i battled a lot but i mean i think i eventually came to but i just realized that you know just that level of readiness for that transition i don't think i was adequately prepared for it it's so interesting that you say that because i do actually hear this often that a person will be at university or a tertiary institution they're doing incredibly well their marks are good but it isn't a guarantee that your transition into the working world will actually be easy there's so many challenges mm. um you know just adjusting to what is expected of you within corporate mm. and then obviously there are those challenges of being black and mm. female yes. and all of those you know preconceived ideas mm. that your colleagues may have of you how did you find yourself navigating those challenges in the corporate world how did what what type of mentality did you approach to that so i worked in management um um consulting right and i think those of you who know that environment mm. it's very cutthroat it's very competitive you are constantly comp uh, they even you know they do like what they call you know the bell curving or you're mm. compared with your peers how you're doing you are constantly told that you need to be visible so as a as a shy quiet introvert I, I never really adjusted to that kind of mm. fast paced you know um when when a partner comes on site let me be the first one to go and tell her mm. all we've done i'll be like as long as i'm doing my work i'll be okay and i realized that life is not always about that it's not always about the people who do the work because there are a lot of mm. hard working smart people that are behind the scenes that don't get the recognition they deserve because Absolutely. they don't surface it and then the people who are more extroverted and they mm. put themselves out there mm. they let the people know about what they've done and what they're achievements are they get the recognition for me that was the first um learning that i did because at school i didn't have to be an extrovert yes i had to just get in my room do my work submit it i get the marks and it's done Precisely. i don't have to impress anyone right yes. so so my work spoke for itself whereas yeah. in corporates it wasn't like that i had to find a diff i had to be a different person which mm -hmm. i wasn't which is why i then battled and i and i found it a bit toxic that kind of environment and i was and i think it was it was very i, I think uh, at the time, I didn't realize it, but I think I was depressed. Mm. <laughs> I was really depressed because even just going to work um, was a mission. And here I was uh, working for a, a top management accounting, I mean, a management consulting firm with all the perks that any graduate would have killed for. But I was miserable and people didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, you know what? I can relate to this so much. I I worked at a merchant bank. I was in a great position on an upward trajectory, but there was something within my soul that was being eaten because I found that every single day we had to perform. You had to appear to be doing a lot. Mm. You you had to, you know, be having strategic conversations. And I just felt that there wasn't really space for one to be their authentic self and still get the job done and still get the necessary recognition for what you've done. Mm. In what ways have you found yourself being able to lean into your voice while still remaining authentic to who you are? I think I understand who I am now and I understand my limitations. So as a young, impressionable, um, you know, a young person at the age of 21 being thrown into such um, an environment, I wasn't equipped. Mm. I didn't understand who I was. Mm. Uh, so having having now matured a bit, and I understand my limitations, mm. and I understand that you know I'm an introvert. I'm a person that likes doing systems and working behind the scenes. But there are certain situations that call for me to mm. be out there and put myself out there. And so for those situations, I then you know 
<laughs> and yeah. I do it and then I go back to my corner because I understand that that is required yes. and as, as, uh, hence I was telling you earlier that it's you can, you can be the most brilliant person yeah. but if nobody knows what you're doing then it's all going to waste that is just the nature of um, life you know mm. extroverts are rewarded mm. for, the, for the mere either just for the mere fact that they put themselves out there so if you want any level of success you have to get put yourself out there you have to be uncomfortable you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable yes you know so you need to for example if you're in the online space you need to get comfortable in front of the camera yes you need to get comfortable speaking to people Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so so i understand that and so for me it works in a way because i do it mostly online but still before i need to do it i need to you know do some meditations and calm myself yes. and then i do it and then i go back again to my corner so i understand that now and yes. so now i can i can i can operate within those limitations that i've got mm -hmm. and so even when i need to meet people i need i meet with them and then i go back to my corner again and I'm like okay mm. it's done but I understand that it's the nature of the job so you need to find that limit between um, you know being an introvert but also understanding that people need to know if nobody knows what you do yes. they can't support it they can't buy from you they can't yes. do anything yes. so you can be the most brilliant person in the world if nobody knows about it it's no good Yes. so that yes. is why then I had to sort of learn that balance between being an introvert but also being extroverted when I need to yes absolutely I love that so much it's, it's tapping into the different areas of yourself and then also recognizing when you can go and come aside and just refuel yourself mm. to be able to move forward. So having been in a work environment that didn't necessarily speak too much to your own personal values, how were you able to then transition into environments that do speak and highlight your strengths within the working world? I think that was the first learning curve for me that 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 made me realize that um, success is not black and white. Yeah, um, there's many gray areas, and we are not told these things during the 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 the, the graduate recruitment programs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they tell us about the nice benefits. You're gonna travel all over the world and do all these fancy things. La la, you get a cut allowance. It's all wonderful, right? And mm. you get excited as a graduate, but never yeah. nobody ever t tells you about the psychological elements. You know, the mental illness that, that's around. All of those things we were we're thrown in the deep end. So, yes. having understood that and now moving out of it and now realizing that these are my limitations and this is what I need to do, and therefore where where can I play to my strengths? Mm -hmm. So my strengths are, you know, in, in, in numbers, my strengths are in creating systems and those kinds of things. That is where I'm strongest at. But when I need to as well, I need to put myself out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing, for example, I think when I did, I did a postgraduate um I did a, 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 I did a, a postgraduate diploma in management and then I did my MBA. And I think in as much as people think MBA is all about finance and marketing, whatever. So those two programs, I think a good 30 to 40 percent of the content was about knowing yourself. Wow. Interesting. It's about knowing yourself. The causes are around understanding who you are and building your, your, your yourself. So the so the, I mean, if you're doing an MBA, you're never gonna be a, a specialist. You are meant to be in leadership. Yes. It's a leadership development course. So you don't have to know the specifics around marketing, around operations, around fine. You don't. You just need to know so that they don't BS you. But you don't need to know the details. Yes. So what's important is for you to understand who you are as a leader and how you can then bring the best in people who are your team. Mm -hmm. So in order to not only bring the best out of yourself and also bring the, the best out of other people it's to understand that you're gonna have the slim dealers who are brilliant but are not mm. surfacing it how do you get that out of them you're gonna have the loud mouths who are not delivering mm. but talk mm. you know so how do you then say okay no i hear you hate you're excited mm. about but what was your specific role in mm. this tell me about you know dig deeper because yes. now i understand that yes. so now you understand the dynamics and so you can then work and, and build not only yourself but also be able to identify the different characteristics that are available in the, in, in, in the, in the business world and how you can leverage that to make sure that you realize your, your objectives. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to leadership, those who have uh, worked under your leadership, whether it's in work or in business, how do you think they would describe Slindile the leader? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, I think I'm, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm all about people development. I'm really all about giving you the space that you need to perform and then leaving you to do it. Mm. So I'm not all about, you know, being a, a, a micromanager 
you, you, you do what you need to do and then you come to me when you need help because another thing is that I can't be doing all the work because then I'll be busy so it's, about, uh, so it's about giving you the space to deliver and supporting you to do it so that is I think what they would say about me that I give them chances and I give them the opportunities to develop according to what they're interested in so part of leadership also, of course, is about having difficult conversations. Yes. And, and these come around a lot. And yeah. I think it often challenges our leadership style because I think inherently as people, we all want to be liked. Yes. And we try to avoid these difficult conversations because they're not nice. Mm -hmm. How do you approach difficult conversations? As you, as you rightfully said, Hetty, um, difficult conversations um, unnecessary. Mm. So as people, we tend to be, well, I speak for myself, we tend to I want to avoid confrontation. Mm. So we know that if, for example, I hire somebody who's going to do this, if they don't do the job, now I need to be looking at them and, 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 and reprimanding them. And, and, and so you end up just saying, you know what, I'll do it myself. Mm. Mm. So now you end up spending a lot of time doing things that you shouldn't be doing because yes. you're not facing the reality that maybe you don't trust your judgment skills yeah. to get the right people you don't touch you don't have the right management skills yeah. to make sure that you manage those people appropriately yeah. so it should be a question of why is it that you want to do all this work and so therefore how do you then get people to assist you and manage those difficult conversations so that you can still get the best in people. So sometimes difficult conversations are necessary. Yeah. Because sometimes a person is genuinely unaware. Yes, yes, that can happen, absolutely. They're genuinely unaware. Yeah. You haven't set the right expectations. You haven't set the right boundaries. You haven't given them proper job descriptions. They do what they think is necessary to mm. get the job done. And meanwhile, when are they going this way, when are you going that way? Yes. If you're not bringing them towards where you're going, they're going to continue going off on a tangent. Yes. So it's about making clear what your expectations are mm. and working mm. and having those conversations because sometimes they really do bring out the best in people because now they understand what you're about and what it is that you're looking for yeah i love that because also you're you're not going in there with um uh, assumptions yeah. that you know people are intentionally slacking there could be a possibility that they're simply not aware correct so that is actually such a great tip that you've given us there so how do we then go from slim dealer who is moving up in the corporate world who's done an mba who's got all of this amazing leadership skills to an individual that is now also moving and shaking within the property world what planted that seed in you that actually I don't only need to depend on my salary. <laughs> um, so it started when I I was fortunate enough to have been able. Okay, when I first started working, I rented for like a year, um, and then I realized, oh, you know what? I'm actually going to buy my first property. So I bought the first property at the age of 23. It was a two bedroom. I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy a house. Then I'm going to be comfortable. I live here until one day I get married or have kids, whatever. So it needs to have all the creature comforts that I need, right? So. As I said, I was fortunate enough to have landed, you know, a, a, a good, um, um, great job in, in a management consulting firm. So I could afford those kinds of things, right? Mm. So I got this two-bedroom house and after a while, if you, it was around 2007, seven, eight. the interest rates were starting to go up and I was starting to like, like struggle to keep up with the bond payments because they were literally going up every quarter. Mm. And I thought, okay, you know what? I've got a two-bedroom space. I don't really need the other room, so why am I not renting it out? This was like pre-Airbnb mm. days for those of you guys that are now into Airbnb, you know? Yeah. So now I was like, I can actually rent out the other room, you know? Other people call it house hacking. So it's like you, you, you realize that you've got this space that you don't need. Why not rent it out? So that's what I did, you know? I rented um, the other bedroom out. And it was like, okay, so this now is additional income that's coming that I didn't have before. I like this. And also, to be fair, at home, we did also have a room. So we did have, you know, that rental income coming in. So it wasn't like I'd never been exposed to this kind You're of thing You're familiar before. with the concept. I was familiar with the concept. Okay. You know, so... So anyway, so after realizing that I can actually sublet my, my room and make additional money, I was like, I like this. And then this one, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be more intentional, and then went and actually bought an investment property. So for me, I was like, okay, now I'm getting income from this property, and I'm getting, I still had the other one as well. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm having this additional income that I didn't have, Yeah. you know? And for me, it was that realization that, um, you know, my mom passed away in 2007, and those back rooms are there till this very day. Wow. You know? And so it's like that realization that that cash flow enabled us to get through that period yes yes um it was still able to sustain 
the, the house, pay food, pay electricity, all those other things, right? So that is the magic with property in that you buy the, you do the, the work of finding the property one time mm. and you put in an offer, you get the bank to finance it. If you're going to even better get a tenant, the tenant comes and pays the rent. Mm. So you just sitting there as a landlord, essentially doing minimal work and you're just getting money. Yeah. So for me, it was just that realization that my salary alone is not enough. I need to yeah. start building additional streams of income. And if I've got this asset, not only is it going to benefit me, but it's also going to possibly uh, benefit me in my pension days and also my future children as well. Yeah. So that is how I got started. What is the one thing you wish people knew about getting multiple streams of income through property? Because often at times we rely on our one stream of income, whether it's our salary, whether it's our business income, and we're so afraid to navigate outside of that. And so everything is reliant on that one particular income. With you having had a taste of both, mm. one income stream from work and now multiple streams from property what do you wish people would know about this it's that um it's very dangerous to rely on a single income stream because you, you might, if you think about it it's your, your income streams must be like a table like it must have four legs maybe not around like this one but like a normal table mm. right so that even if one can break the other three can hold on until you can replace the other one mm. so if you've just got this I one thing that. that your whole table collapses flat mm. right so you need to use the salary that you've got to start supplementing your addition your, your income in the future mm. because if you're just relying on your salary and then and then your job ends for whatever reason or you are disabled or whatever you lose that income stream and it's gone Absolutely. whereas if you start taking looking at your salary as a seed that you can now plant elsewhere so fine you're going to have your living expense and whatever you but take some of the money even if you start with just five percent of your salary and you start looking at what other assets can i start planting the seeds mm. uh, that will benefit me in the future. So no one is saying take your whole income and, and go and invest in, in property or anything, but just start gradually building those income streams because that is just one of the things that you will thank yourself for doing in the future. Those sacrifices that you do now are what you will thank, thank yourself for in the future. What incredible thing have you been able to accomplish through the income that you've received through property investing? Okay, so I did my PDM, right? At the mm -hmm. time it was a two year course at VITS. Mm -hmm. And then I finished. And then, so you had like a five year window within which you, you had to do your MBA in order to get some of the credits, right? So instead of the MBA being two years, then it would be one year. Okay. So some of my classmates were like, ah, oh, Slee, let's do the MBA, let's just do it, let's push and finish. And I, and I remember one day after class, I sat outside and I'm like, yeah, but where am I gonna find this money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, where am I going to find this money to pay? Because the MBA is like, just the course alone was around, this is now, when did, when did I do that? 2017, 2018. It was 250,000 rand. Sure. Just yeah. the course alone, right? Yeah. Never mind the additional stuff, the international element. We had to do the books and everything mm -hmm. else that comes with it. So I was like, Ish, where am I going to find this money? And I got into a depression. I'm like, I do want to do it. I want to finish because like, if I feel like, I felt like if I stopped, I wasn't going to continue yes. because at the time my children were still small. When I was doing my PDM, my kids were small. So I thought if I take a break, it would be difficult for me to resume and get into the rhythm of things. I had already done two, two years of this. Yeah. I was attending Mondays and Wednesday evenings after work doing assignments. I was already in there. So let me just push one just more year keep and finish. Momentum. Keep the momentum. Yeah. And I was like, now where am I going to get the money from? I, I depressed, depression, depression, until one night I woke up and I'm like, wait a minute, mm. I've got a property mm. that I can refinance and I can get this money. What? <laughs> so you refinanced your property? Yes, and it's got a tenant. Wow. So I, very next day, I called the bank. So how does this work? How can I get money out? They're like, I know, simple. And at the time, I remember I bought this property around 2007. So it really yes. had equity. I had been paying down the bond. The bank was like, ah, oh, just fill in this form. I fill in the form. Notification. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the things that I've been able to achieve. And subsequent to that, when I realized the, 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 the power of refinancing and how easy mm. it was, because now the property is still there, it's, now it's got even more equity. So like life goes on, right? So now I realize I can actually use the very same strategy and extract some of the money from this property and use it to bankroll the rest. Yes. 
yes absolutely so now when this one's got a little bit of equity so now that obviously i'm a little bit more sophisticated as an investor i'm always buying below market value and creating that initial equity from the get-go mm. so that if i need to use the money i can even use it as soon as that property registers so now wow. that money is available and then you can use it you know to buy more properties to do an mba to finance whatever it is that your heart desires really Wow, wow, this is absolutely incredible. So you have had, you know, such an interesting uh, property investment journey um, in that not only have you invested for yourself, but you also have created the largest property stock fell, Sakisizo property stock fell. How did you go from that to this enormous endeavor that you've been able to put together? What Sakisizo property stock fell? Yes. So, like I was saying, that I started investing in property, and I'm like, hey, this thing works, most guys. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we can do this. But now the limitation was obviously with not the right knowledge at the time. I was like, but now if I'm gonna continue borrowing money from the bank, the bank is not gonna give me any more money. But if we could all club in and actually contribute, we could now buy blocks because now I was buying like a little one bedroom, a little two bedroom, whatever. So now imagine if with just our our funds and our qualification, we could go and buy blocks yes yes so instead of me being able to just acquire one little flat we can now big, do bigger deals so for me there was the thinking around that and so one day i saw somebody uh posting on facebook hey guys there's so many of us here if we can put in so much money la 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 we can do this and we can actually we can raise so much money and it actually i'm like that's actually a good idea we can start a stock fell like the same stock fells our mothers were doing yeah but we can use the same thing but now for property you know so brilliant <laughs> so then i i was that the, I, I screenshot that that conversation and i sent it to my friends on whatsapp i'm like guys look how amazing is this we can do this and they were like on board like let's get this on the roll so that is how the whole stock wow. fell property stock fell thing um got started with just that realization that we could actually do more if we're a group yeah Yes, absolutely. And I love that concept because also it allows more people to participate. Yes, so yes. you don't have to have huge amounts of money. The little that you have can still go a long way. Absolutely. Um, has it surprised you the growth of Saki Suzu Property Stockville? Absolutely, Hetty. Um, in, in fact, I think people are more... Um, I think, like I told you earlier, that being a person who always feels that they're not doing enough, mm. um, always feels that they're not good enough. I don't know if that, this, like, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm putting it out there correctly. Mm. You always feel like you don't even appreciate the mm. magnitude of, of the, what you've of what you've created, right? Yeah. So I always get surprised when people say, "Hostly, oh, you inspired." I'm like, I'm like looking. Are you talking to the person <laughs> behind me? You're like, "Hostly." <laughs> you know I'm saying, and and so for me, it it was just you know uh, uh, to the point that I was making that i'm just a person that just prefers to do the work mm. i just want to just get things done and i don't even stop and like wow look back this is what i've done which is what you know the opposite of us extroverts do they mm. they put it out there they talk about all their achievements and how yes. wonderful they are and for me it's just about let me just do it let me just do the work let me just, let me just get, get the work down, down and let, yeah. me, let me put my head down and work so all this noise and everybody saying oh this is so cool or whatever it doesn't even register mm. in my mind you know it doesn't even because i'm just like what do we need to do what is the next thing we need to do and i'm not even you know stopping to smell the roses and say this is how far we've come this is the achievements that we've actually um been able to achieve in in in, in, the, in the time that Sakisizo has been around wow the, i mean geez Sakisizo is doing so incredibly well and it's continuously growing you know from strength to strength it's i i'm, I'm always so i always admire what you guys have been able to achieve with it what are some of your favorite property deals that you've been able to do through Saki Um Our favorite uh, properties, I think it's always the, um, the first ones, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the first one that we did, which was a student accommodation in Durban, that one was, was pretty special because all along the... Um, it had been an idea mm. so you never know you know as, as business people and entrepreneurs and i'm sure gonna be watching this channel you never know if you've got a real product until yeah. somebody pays for it yes so <laughs> all along we all think we're brilliant <laughs> we mm. all think we're amazing we all think our ideas are amazing otherwise we wouldn't venture out into doing into business right mm. but until somebody actually exchanges money for your idea mm. you don't have a business yes <laughs> so True. it's still an idea so that first property is special because that was the first one we went to market with and people said we like it we're going to back it we're gonna put money yeah. behind it because all along it had been ideas and, and talk and whatever else but this is the first time that people actually said yes 
and they put money. Yeah, and it, it validates it validates it. Yeah. the concept. Yeah, and it's also the very same deal that I then entered Investor of the Year with wow. because I said this was. Uh, and, uh, I mean, so I wasn't even around that long when I entered Investor of the Year. I think we launched in July and I entered the competition in September. Incredible, and you won, and we won. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so, wow! You know, wow. so it was a matter of um, let me just throw my, 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 my hat in there and see what happens. Um, so I answered them, um, you know, we've got this unique concept, we're investing in property as a group, la 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 la. And clearly the, the judges and the public like the idea of what we're doing and that is how, you know, we want. I think that deal is, the, is a special one because it was the first proof of concept. Yes. You know, and that this, this can work. So I think that one will always be special. Gosh, I really love that. You know, um, it, 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 it's also testament to the fact that when you have an idea, you execute and you take action. Yes. You don't just sit on that idea. And then also just taking a leap of faith. And here we are sitting with you, SA Investor of the Year. What I really love about you, Slee, is the fact that you don't keep your accomplishments to yourself. You're a very knowledgeable and open and transparent individual to the point where you even have a mentorship program let's talk a little bit about that what inspired you to want to share your knowledge with others i realized that a lot of people don't have the right knowledge mm. um, for an example if i look back to where i was as a 23 year old starting to get invested in property with, with what i know now mm. you know i would have been i would have, I, I would be in a different place yes so it's about that lack of knowledge and to also just Give back. Yes. It's about giving back and it's about um, exposing people up to opportunities mm. that property investing can do. I've seen what it has done in my life. I've seen what it has done in my mentees' lives and everybody that I've coached in the past. So so I've, I've had mentees, for example, who have been able to accommodate, um, purchase six properties in one year. Wow. That's incredible. So imagine if I had known what I know now yeah. back in 2007 yeah. and I would have done that. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? So yeah. I had to spend all this time, trial and error, trial and error, but now I'm at a position whereby I can take what I've learned and package it and give it with somebody who's driven and they run with it. Yes, yes, you know? absolutely. And so it's about just creating that level of awareness and being that support structure because sometimes people are afraid to invest in property, they're afraid of making mistakes because they feel like they're on their own. Whereas if you are working with a reliable coach and mentor who's walked the path, who knows what it takes, then that becomes easier. Absolutely. Because now you've got a sounding board. You've got somebody who can say, uh, uh, here, be careful of this. Mm -hmm. Here are the opportunities. This is how to identify op op opportunities. Because some of the mistakes that people make is they believe that you can't go wrong with property, that mm -hmm. any property is a, is a good property. Not, not so, guys. You still need to understand that you are running a property business Precisely. if you are planning on renting it out yeah. so you the the, the, the the fundamentals around business still needs to be in place so that is why you know I, it's a passion of mine to give back to my mentees that are coaching my program which is um the, the, the Property uh, Wealth Accelerator Program. Yes, mm. absolutely. And I've seen, I mean, even on your socials as well, you often do lives, you mm. often um, advise people, you are constantly having conversations that empower people, um, which I find to be really so inspirational. Mm. So having looked at your entire journey, Sleeve, from Petra Teeth, entering into this huge jungle of a city and, and really making your mark both in corporate and in investing what does the future hold for you and what does success look like to Slindile? my success is when i see others succeed mm. so i think for me when i see people that i've worked with when i see them succeed in life i feel like i've, I've i vicariously succeed through yes, them <laughs> you know yes. so i think for me that is really having made that impact um, you know, even with the work with Sakisuza Property Stockfield, our members, are, you're not just putting your money and then we go away and then whatever. Mm. We involve our members. We have monthly meetups. We have guests who come and teach um, our members about property. So it's about leaving that mark, about saying that, you know, we came into, um, you know, this industry that, to be honest, still is not that accessible to a lot of us. Yes. yes. It is still not. So through the Property Stockfell, we are now able to allow 
ordinary South Africans to come and have a taste of this is what it takes in property. Absolutely. So you find that most of them, it's the first time that they get exposed and through what we do, they then decide that they want to level up and start investing in their own rights through the kind of knowledge that we share mm -hmm. and the opportunities that we present to our members. So I think for me, my real success is in the legacy and the impact that I would have made behind and also the successes of my mentees as well. Oh, absolutely love that. And I think that is such a, a fantastic note to begin to draw off this conversation from. Slindile, when we think about Slindile Leseyane and when we have conversations about you when we you are not in the room, what do you hope that we will say about you? Good things. <laughs> Only good things. Only good things. Gosh, I absolutely <laughs> love that. On that note, Slintile, I I really just want to thank you for this really wonderful conversation and just sharing yourself so openly with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Hetty, for inviting me. I've had an awesome time.